Good evening and thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Family Matters. My name is Purity Museo. As the country continues to grapple with the adverse effects of coronavirus, counties are bearing the brunt of the economic impact occasioned by this deadly disease. And Narrow County has already recorded over 100 cases of COVID-19. So how is this pandemic affecting the economic activities of this county? It is known to thrive, especially through tourism and agricultural activities. Again, Again, have they achieved their 300 isolation bed capacity? Let's now speak with Narok County Governor Samuel Tunai to just bring us to speed on what are some of the preparedness, the level of preparedness and also the activities going on here, how they are also trying to cushion uh, the people, traders affected by this coronavirus. Welcome to this broadcast and now help me welcome our guest tonight, Governor Tunai. Thank you so much for your time and we appreciate for having us. Thank you for having me. Yes. Let's um, begin with um, from June and now, that when you reported your first case, there are, you have over 100 cases of COVID-19 as compared to other counties that reported their first cases earlier than Narok did. Maybe you can tell us why are we having increasing cases of this county? Does it have anything to do with uh, the easing of movement, especially on the three counties that had been under these uh, restrictions, or it's... Kenyans in Narok who are not following the prevention protocols. Again, uh, um, first of all, uh, I want to welcome you, uh, the KBC and the team, to Narok County, Kariboni. Again, uh, I want to say thank you for having me on this show. It's a pleasure to have this uh, conversation with you. Um, uh, for a long time, you know, this pandemic started in March, as you remember. And we got our first case three months after. That was actually 30 June. Yes. That is when we got our first case. And you remember that uh, when His Excellency, when actually to begin with, when the World Health Organization declared uh, coronavirus as a pandemic, then subsequently countries took upon themselves the challenges of trying to manage the, the, the COVID-19 his Excellency the President, I remember, then came in and made a pronouncement uh, that uh, all schools uh, be shut. That now, from then, that was March around then, there was a lockdown uh, in Nairobi and Mombasa, and thereafter uh, Mandera and some hotspots. I remember that. And for those three months, we have been able to contain the spread of this virus successfully in this county. Uh, as you remember, because of the lockdown, there was a restriction of movements uh, between Nairobi and uh, which then it was the hotspots and Mombasa, of course, to Naro County. And we didn't have any case. Uh, but after, uh, you know, for good reasons, he solicited the president remove the restrictions. And you know that by that time, you people, the Nairobians, you know, at that time, by, by, by then, really, I believe uh, it's like, you know, we are pastoral people. And many times when you uh, close in the cows for a long time, and then all of a sudden you release, release them. them, especially to go and take salt, you know, they will run out. At that time, when the president removed the restriction, you know, there was a big influx of movement of people, especially from Nairobi and Mombasa to the rural areas. So, in other words, between July, when the restrictions were lifted, and now mm. the cases of COVID-19 have increased in this county exactly. for those reasons that you've mentioned. After so, were you ready for this, or what is the level of preparedness in terms of when the head of state declared that you can now move around for reasons that you said, good reasons, economic reasons. So what is the level, what was the level of preparedness at that time? Because now you have over 100 cases of COVID-19. Would you say that uh, you are prepared and you, you've been able to build your capacity because we, we expect the cases to keep rising as people keep interacting and moving to this county? Uh, Purity, we started preparation immediately the president made the, the pronouncement in March because we knew then that we are part and parcel of this country and there is no way we are going to escape. We had to be prepared. 
and we had put in proper measures then before the removal of the restriction very successfully. Now, um, from March, which we already started, you remember, His Excellency, the President called in for a summit in, at State House Nairobi. And one of the resolutions was that every county must have a minimum of 300 uh, beds, isolation centers. Um, and, and there was some money which was given by the national government. Narok only actually got only 50, 50 million. The account which got up to 300 million. That is for another day. However, uh, I think just to answer your question, I want to say yes. We are. We made the necessary preparations as a county to mitigate against the spread of this virus to the communities. The first thing we did, of course, is to ensure that we have uh, isolation centers. Uh, I think it's important for you to know that as we speak, Narrow County has 440 beds, you know, ready for isolation centers. The, the, no, no, not 440, 340, 300 and about 50. Uh, this hospital, our main referral hospital, we have about uh, 11. And then we have another hospital in Kilgoris, which has uh, 9. And then in Rejangare, we have about 10. Uh, Emurwa Dikir, that actually is another 40, which are ready, so it's going to add from the 340 to 380. And then, uh, of course, the, our main one is at Ololonga. That's where we have done the 300 bed capacity. Uh, and three, 200 already, you know, people are already there. The, f the final one, as you probably go and see, will be finished in, on Saturday. Fill equipped, the beds are there, the sheets, everything has been bought and ready. In, in case of a surge, because there are a lot of uh, movements, especially to this county being yes. a tourism county, in case there is a surge and all the 340 or so beds are occupied by patients, do you have capacity to expand this? And as, enough as I say, yes. 340 are ready. Mm -hmm. I say there is another 40, which just we need to equip, that brings to 380. And already we are also, immediately this is finished, we are starting another 200 beds in Kilgoris. So we are on to ensure that uh, we have enough beds. And so far, actually, uh, at the moment, we have about 162 cases, 162, out of which we have about uh, 80 recoveries. Half of them have already recovered. Then there are those who are at, uh, who they are, we have isolated them at their home and we continue to manage them. The ones, actually, the only beds occupied now is about 26. So we still have a, num a number of uh, uh, beds. I think it's important for you to know that in line with the collaboration with the national government, which is also on the, the, the uh, directive, is that we are encouraging uh, people to stay at home, what we call home care. But of course, before any person qualify to isolate at home, we have a committee uh, of county government which must go and ensure that they meet the minimum requirements, their requirements which must be met. And, and therefore, for any of the persons who uh, want to stay at home, they must meet those uh, requirements. And then we are encouraging them. So there is the space and we continue to prepare, we continue to invest to ensure that we, we do also have a, we have enough beds. Yeah. The, sec the other thing, because you have asked about um, preparation, we have also done a lot of sensitization using the massive vernacular radios. We have also used the Kalenjin because we have a big population here. We have done road, road shows at the county level just to sensitize so that people can wear masks, just to ensure that people sanitize, just to ensure people uh, keep social distance. We have ensured that uh, also that exercise continues. is continuous. We have also had meetings with the leadership of the church, all the faiths, including the Muslims, and they're also helping us in the churches and the, the mosque to sensitize the people so that uh, the people themselves be in the front line in terms of uh, ensuring that 
they are prepared. Mm. Uh, I can assure you, I want to tell you that uh, purity, that for us as government to succeed in this war against the virus, the people must be in the front line. You know, there is how much you can do, to forcing people, telling people you must wear. Then when the police are not there, they remove it. So that's why we are trying to sensitize us by telling them that it's about their lives and their future. There's a lot of movement of people into this county uh, because of some coming for their own personal leisure uh, reasons. So apart from wearing of masks and uh, washing hands, keeping social distancing, how is the, how is the county government ensuring there's no uh, more importation of COVID-19 from other areas to Narok? That's a good question. Um, what we did, and not just the other day, actually we did it when there was even lockdown. We have seven checkpoints in this county. And we have ensured that there is a multi-agency which is working. We have ensured that the multi-agency, which, which of course uh, includes the health, our health, public health workers, uh, ensure that there is uh, people uh, temperatures are taken before entry and of course this goes to Masai Mara because you know that's uh, now uh, after the removal of uh, restrictions a lot of Kenyans and thank you for Kenyans have flocked to the Masai Mara game reserve those lots are were there over the weekend with CS Balala and Kipchoge and it's full and we're happy about it and as a county government, we have done all the preparations. One thing we have done is, before any camp or lodge is open in the Masai Mara Game Reserve, the county government tests all the staff before any Mugeni comes in. And we are doing it free. The county government is meeting the cost of, uh, of testing. As, as a county government, and those facilities are working together, as that is very critical in ensuring that uh, all the measures all the directly from the Ministry of Health are being complied. And what are some of the challenges that the county government is facing while responding to this pandemic because there are a lot of complaints from the frontline health workers that they are not getting the kind of protection all over the country, the kind of protection they may require, talks of a delay of salaries, substandard uh, personal protective equipment. Are you encountering that challenge with the frontline health workers here? And why are these complaints coming up? Does it have to do with uh, county governments not coming in or the resources that you've been allocated? I think uh, you can blame the county government per se, but I can speak for Narok. We have never had any delay, except actually this month, and it is mainly because of, uh, of course, there is this, uh, uh, you know, it was a new financial year, and therefore uh, a budget, we needed the county allocation revenue fund to be approved by the Senate. Uh, and even if you had money, you cannot pay. So we have never had such delays. We have, like the allowances which uh, were given to the, by the national government for all the frontline workers, we already dispersed them. I think they were just supposed to be part of their salaries. We had to do, to readjust our budgets, to take money from other sectors to fight COVID-19, which is, as you know, never enough because this disease was never planned for, it just came. And we had to direct a lot of our resources from other sectors to, to health, so we had to fight COVID. So that itself is a big cost. So I must tell you that financials is, is, a, is a challenge. And then secondly, uh, the other challenge of course is it has to do with the attitude of the community sometime. We had to do a lot of public sensitization to, to the people uh, continuously. But even up to now, you'll know, you'll go to town and you find some people who are not wearing masks. You find people who are still, uh, you know, very careless in their movements. Losing, uh, not losing, but having at least eight healthcare workers infected with COVID-19 is a huge number for a county because these are the frontline workers who are supposed to be treating uh, patients who develop com complications from COVID-19. The issue of substandard personal protective equipment, because most of them say they are getting infected while in line of duty. How is the county responding to that? I have done a proper investigation on, on the eight. And although, uh, uh, you know, you know, 
these health workers, as you know, they have to go and treat these people. And uh, I can assure you as a county, we have ensured that we produce, first of all, we are producing our own. You know, they say necessity is a mother of nation. We have our own vocational institute. We are producing masks for the public and, uh, you know, even some other workers. Uh, but because of, you know, the sensitivity of the uh, cases which the health workers are handling. With the health workers are actually using the N95. We purchase them, they are all over. And whatever they have always asked, whatever they have asked, we have bought them. So I want to assure you where I see it, our health workers are taken care of properly. They have the PPEs. We have taken a whole hotel where all the health workers stay so they don't go to their homes when they are uh, when they are treating and after they finish their shifts because they work in shifts they stay on for two weeks at the that hotel without movement because because we give them another one week off and before they leave to uh, they go on off we test them to ensure that they are negative so that they don't go and affect their people but after they leave our premises you never know again where they do nevertheless we are working they are understanding we are capacitating them to the best of our ability and and where i see it i don't think we have any issues there the children are at home uh, because schools were closed and uh, with parents majority of whom have lost their livelihoods what is the county doing to cushion these vulnerable communities or people who've been adversely affected economically they have closed their businesses lost their jobs to covid 19. okay that is uh, also a very important question because it is with us and actually as you know when the president was pressed on what to do, whether to reopen the economy or not, it was a very tough balancing act because it's between COVID, which you know you allow, you open the restrictions, there are dangers, and of course the economy, you know, because people have lost jobs, they have lost businesses, and uh, the situation is becoming dire. What we did, first of all, just immediately uh, there was a restriction of movements uh, within the country. And of course, uh, when uh, the airspace was closed, as you know, Masai Mara Game Reserve depend on tourists from overseas. And of course, you know, our markets were hit in the United States, Europe, China, and so forth. Uh, hotels closed. So people lost jobs. The first thing I did was I asked those lodges and camps to continue paying all those staffs until you know the situation uh, is, is normalized again. I'm happy to report that there are a number of lodges and camps which uh, you know uh, uh, decided to uh, agree with my request, and they were still paying. In fact, some others has budgeted up to December. So that was good because they continued getting their salaries. However, there are some which paid half, which was still better, and the others who uh, stopped payment. Of course, this was coming to Narok is a great loss because, uh, as, I, as you have just said, and I uh, want to repeat again, uh, Narok County collects, uh, last year, 2019, we collected about 2.4 billion from the Masai Mara Game Reserve. Now, that is not nowhere again. So as a county, that's what we've lost. The national government have lost a lot because of so many tourists who come to their country and Mara. And then, uh, normally, uh, there are a lot of women who earn their livelihoods from these businesses, especially tourists. So they sell the big work, you know, this kind of to the tourists and from that they are able to take their children to school and feed their families and look after. Now, that was no longer there. Then there are tour guides who also depend on that. You know, they, they carry the wageni, the, the tourist, to the mother to do game drives and they earn their livelihood from there. Now, that was no longer there. And of course, I've talked about the jobs and the hotels themselves, they lost. So, what have we done? One, first of all, 
uh, you know, His Excellency the President came with a stimulus package. That was great. One billion of it is to assist the conservancies. We have conservancies outside the game reserve who are employing a lot of people and also where a lot of people derive their livelihood. That stimulus package is going to help so many, which is a great thing. And then, of course, the package to uh, renovate hotels and all that will also help the uh, capitalize uh, the hotel so that they go on their businesses as they have already done. Now, as a county, what we immediately then did was, you know, we had also closed markets, but now we have reopened slowly. And what we have done is we have allowed the traders to enter the markets without paying anything. So there is no sales, they are not paying the sales, which is uh, normally a cost also to them, just to help them. And would you say the easing of the restrictions in Nairobi, Mombasa and Mandera has somehow uh, boosted or revived the economy in this uh, county? Uh, Mara is full. The hotels have reopened. Those people who have been who are working have gone back to work. So that itself is a big relief to us, in spite of the fact that on one hand <laughs> the numbers are going up. So that's good. And then uh, we expect a number of international guests with the uh, you know, reopening of the airspace, so that is also, that will be good. We saw some lodge and camps are saying good their bookings, so that's good. And then, of course, um, there are a number of uh, people now coming to Narok Town because, you know, this is also an agricultural county. We produce, for your information, uh, Bali. 80% of Bali which is used by Rubuya, it's come from Narok. 80%. Uh, 60% of Kenya wheat come from uh, this county. About 40% of the meat eaten in Amachoma uh, is uh, come from Narok. Mm -hmm. You know? We produce so much potatoes, vegetables, you know, a lot of milk and so forth. So, when there was a lockdown, we had a big problem because there was no market. You know, although the, you remember that the government had allowed the essentials, but it was still a challenge because there are so many small-scale farmers inside the rural areas who were not able to, you know, uh, sell because uh, unless it is picked to go to Nairobi. So that itself has really helped to boost the economy. And of course, many of them, Nairobi being a transit town, city, the passes going on to South Rift and Begori uh, and so forth. There are so many. They stop over. People eat, uh, you know, and, and buy some things. So that itself has really helped us uh, in terms of ensuring the economy in, mm. of Narok is revived. Yeah, and uh, and uh, the world is fighting a pandemic that no one knows exactly what it is and how it spreads because there is a lot of mutations of this virus being reported is allowing a lot of people into this county not a little bit risky uh, for you as a county government because it could be exposing the population to the virus that may affect them badly there's no treatment there's no vaccine what's your take on that you know uh, we as a county government we are operate under a constitution we have a constitution in this country, which is clear that uh, you know people are free to trade and live anywhere. And uh, when the, re the re restrictions were removed, uh, and people are going to vomit, this is our main trunk road. People must move. I cannot. We cannot stop people from moving, and and so many others because we also have our people who want to transport their goods through their other counties. Uh, I know it's a challenge. Uh, uh, we cannot stop them, or stop them. The only thing we can do is to ensure that at the entrance, which we have done, that there's a checkpoint to measure the temperatures so that those people we, we suspect there's a multi-agency team, then they are stopped. Mm -hmm. But we cannot just disallow people. Yeah. The best is what we are doing, which is to sensitize and the other measures which we have taken mm -hmm. to ensure that uh, the citizens themselves uh, adhere to the rules which we are telling them to protect themselves and their families. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the, the, the virus has spread in all the 47 counties now, yes, yes. and health officials are saying we are yet to get to the peak. It's spreading among community yes, members. Yes. Uh, your take, is there a way we can do as counties and 
Kenyans to stop the, this, the spread of this virus? Okay, there's a question, which is a difficult question. But yes, uh, you, know, you, you know that um, the, the national uh, COVID-19 response team continues to update the country daily, you know, on, on, on the cases. And uh, what we need to do as counties is to have inter-county protocols so that between us, for example, and Kajado and Nakuru and uh, Kericho, which we border, and Bomet, all entry points, we ensure that the counties work jointly uh, and seamlessly to ensure that uh, we are able to restrict any kind of movement of people we suspect to be COVID-19. And a healthcare system, especially in counties, has been, let me use the word if you allow me, struggling, especially for counties. And we've been seeing a lot of referrals to Kenya National Hospitals from counties, and some counties were actually caught off guard with no ICU beds. And medics are saying that this pandemic is offering opportunity to counties to improve their healthcare system, you know. Can this change? Why are we as counties not investing much in the healthcare system or where exactly is the challenge? Right now, and uh, this was also a directive from national government, uh, it, we have been directed that every county uh, budget for health must be at least 30%. In Narok it is 32. It all comes back to the question of resources because Look, uh, whatever is money you get from the uh, uh, equitable share, and of course the local uh, collections, which we know is a challenge, especially now, because there are no businesses, so how, how do you collect the money? As a county boss, um, as you, during the response of COVID-19 disease, what are some of the lessons that you've drawn from this in terms of the gap? Are the gaps there are in the health sector? and how to go about them? Uh, a number of lessons. Uh, first of all, as you know, uh, I think it's, uh, although it is not that we don't want, but I think those are the things we need to learn, that we need to save. Even as a county, you must always have some, some fund to, for such occasions. Because you see, this epidemic just came in. Pandemic just happened, and, and we are not prepared, and there was no saving anywhere you know, as a county, so maybe national. So that, that is uh, one. And then secondly, you know, there is always uh, the issue of staffing, you know, in terms of uh, having enough health workers. Uh, that's we are partnership again with the national government. In the last three months, we employed 261 new health workers. When I came in, I employed about 400 health workers. But you know, population is growing. Uh, you know, we have so many cases which need to be addressed, and it's all about resources. So we need uh, to see how we can collect more, have more money, so that we are able to invest in these in hospitals and also employ qualified staff. At least now we have, and uh, we are also putting up. We are starting in two weeks a uh, medical school, 250 students, so that we can train our own nurses and clinical officers and ensure that uh, we have enough personnel because we must have qualified personnel for us to be able to address these challenges. All right, Governor, tonight we are winding up your parting shots as we finish the show. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, again, uh, uh, I just want to say that uh, as a county government, uh, we continue to serve the people of Narok because that's what we are elected to do. I know for now, uh, COVID-19 is taking a large chunk of our resources, and t including time. Uh, but hopefully, uh, this uh, situation will change. I, I totally believe I'm a Christian. I believe in God. And I know that this pandemic also will come to an end. Uh, I also want to tell the, our people that the people of Naro County, and I extend the whole country, that this pandemic is with us. Uh, let's not think that uh, it will just uh, go like that. It's important for us to 
ensure that the directives which has been given by the national government and the county, that of ensuring that uh, we keep, keep social distance, that we wash our hands, that we sanitize, that we don't go and, and mix unnecessarily with our families and so forth, that we continue to comply with that directive. Mm -hmm. That will really help us ensure that uh, we nim minimize the spread of the disease. And, and let, uh, and, uh, right now the economy is reopened. Let's do the business, but let's be careful. Let's be careful. Yeah. Right, Governor tonight, thank you so much for making time for us. It's great having you on our show tonight. Thank you so much, Asante. Welcome again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not about to see your coffee, too, like any. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. That's all the time we had for our show tonight. Thank you so much for watching, for your company. We highly appreciate. My name is Purity Musa. Do enjoy the rest of our viewing and God bless.